Welcome to the Full Story Series right here at Comic Story. And my name is Benny and I'll be your narrator. So a full story video is basically us taking multiple videos that we've already released on the channel, some that have come out over the course of weeks, months, and sometimes years, and turning it into a long form video for you to enjoy. DC decided to do the Dark Multiverse, which is basically a twisted version of your favorite storylines. And they then created the Tales of the Dark Multiverse to give you more of an idea of what happens in the Dark Multiverse. So today we're going to be bringing you the first five of those, which as of right now are considered a full thing without any additional stories. That doesn't mean they won't make more later, but right now there are five, and that's today's full story. Enjoy the Tales of the Dark Multiverse. Tempest Fuginot stands, his ever-present gauge watching over the expanse of the multiverse. His power, his curse, is that he can move freely between the multiverse and its dark counterpart. He knows that a crisis is coming, possibly the greatest yet. He has come to stare into the dark abyss and see if any of these mutated worlds could be useful in the coming fight. To see if any of the heroes that are forged in the fires of fear can be useful in the upcoming crisis. He turns to a world not unlike our own. In the darkness of Gotham, the bat is broken. He turns his mantle over to the one known as Jean-Paul Valley, who twists the vision of Batman into something darker, deadlier. And eventually, Bruce returns to retake his city from the darkness. Yet in this world, he is not successful, and he feels the piercing of Azrael's blade through his chest. That was the end of Nightfall. Years pass, and the city is purged in holy fire, and it's rebuilt. And thirty years pass in a moment as Tempest watches. In the Dumas house, formerly known as Wayne Manor, Jean-Paul waits on the day's reports. His breathing is labored, as years of protecting his vision has taken its toll on him. Your city is secure, Madeline, his secretary, tells him. But there is an issue that requires your attention. Valley pulls on his armor. His breathing labored as Madeline informs him that they have apprehended an outsider in the city. The man, Luis Ramos, was smuggled in by Oswald Cobblepot. His assortment of weapons speak to his intentions, she tells him. She informs him of the events taking place throughout the United States, the panic and the pandemics. But Valley interrupts her. The outside world does not concern us, he tells her, giving orders to have Cobblepot and Ramos brought to the torch family. But my presence will not be possible. I have other matters to attend to. He gasps at her and she nods. Ah yes, that's today, isn't it? She reaches out her hand, caressing the valley level. Must you really put yourself through that once more, she asks. But Jean-Paul nods, leaning heavily on the banister next to her. I made a promise, Madeline. And what are we without the staples of tradition? Finally, he slides on his helmet, connecting the tubes to his back. The greenish liquid begins to flow, and the venom begins to pump into his system. Valley stands taller, his breathing no longer forced, and he crosses the cave, heading to his Batmobile. The Cardinal and the Torchbearer have my proxy. Make sure that judgment is served, he tells her over his shoulder. The sun begins to set over Wayne Manor, which is thrust to the heavens from the center of Gotham City. The end of the third Sunday, during the last month of the summer, a constant of our time together. Jean Ball states as he crosses the vast chamber at the top of the tower. He reaches out his clawed hand to the person in front of him. Yet today I wonder, will this be the day that changes everything? Will this be the day that you finally admit the truth, Bruce? Bruce hangs from the machine, having nothing more than a torso with his head attached to wires and tubes. His brain can be seen through a jar, pulsing gently. Bruce quickly deduces the reason that his forces have gathered in the center of Gotham. Cobblepot, I'm surprised it's taken you this long. Valley nods. So I have your approval. You have my disdain. The claws contract on Bruce's face and whatever feeling he still has sends pain coursing through what's left of his body. Valley finally turns, noting that Bruce's seizures have grown worse every day. As always, I come offering peace, the simplest acknowledgement, and all of your pain will end. Bruce asks, what about Alfred, Tim, Dick? And Valley turns. He tells Bruce that he did what none of them could. He kept Gotham standing. I was always the Batman that the city needed, Bruce. You only need to say it, and peace will find you. But Bruce refuses. 
You're weak, paranoid, and doped up on more and more venom. Your grasp is slipping. When the next crisis comes, and I promise you, it always comes, you will falter and you will fall. For a brief moment, the two stare at each other until Valley finally returns. Until next year, Bruce. He calls as he exits the chamber. In the city's center, Oswald Cavalpata and Luis Ramos kneel before the warriors known as the Torchbearer and the Cardinal, the armies of Saint Batman behind them. Oswald Cobblepot, you've been charged with aiding and abetting and facilitating access to weapons of war. The proxy begins, but Oswald attempts to interrupt, trying to explain that he doesn't know the man and has never met him before. You are hereby found guilty. Your sentence is death. By the glorious and righteous flame, the torchbearer passes judgment, lifting his flaming sword. Though Cobblepot tries to plead his case, the words fall on deaf ears, and the flaming sword of judgment is swung. The blade cleaves his head from his shoulders, and before it can fall, the torchbearer turns his gaze upon another. Luis Ramos, you have been charged with unlawful entry into Gotham City. But Ramos doesn't seem afraid, staring up into the holy flame, determination in his eyes. Do what you will. It doesn't change what is coming, he tells him. I am just the beginning. The blade falls once more and the proceedings are finished. And the two men turn to the gathered soldiers and the torch bearer raises the blade high. For Gotham! The darkened streets of the city echo with the cries. Yet even as those cries go out, a different sound fills the night air. Explosions rocking through Gotham, erupting one after another. In his bed, Valley sits up, trembles, bringing him out of his fitful sleep. He turns, looking out the window to see his city ablaze, the smoke creating a haze that hangs over Gotham in a cloud. Beneath the manor, he demands a report. Explosions, my love, Madeline tells him. Several acolyte halls have been targeted, and I don't know how many are dead. The screen suddenly flash, and the torchbearer appears, forgiving his report. Heretics are flooding the streets, aided by a shadow army. They raid the main cathedral, trying to wrest control of the city. Sir, it's a coup. Determination and anger fill John Paul's face. Then we will meet them head on. He tells them, opening his armory to reveal rows of venom vials. Saint to sinner. Throughout the streets of Gotham, the police fight against their shadowy opponents with so much death and destruction that no one even notices the single man crossing the river. The swim is easier than what we trained for. His simple reply, and quietly the young man begins to slip through the city, avoiding the fighting, using it to his advantage to stay unnoticed. Finally, he reaches the base of Wayne Tower, slipping through the shadows, removing the guards with a few well-placed strikes, and one turns, seeing him descend. The shadowy killer leaves him alive, though, and as he makes his way towards the entrance of the tower, the guard struggles for his radio, calling in backup. That elevator chimes, and it opens. And the red-hooded figure states, I heard what they did to you. Bruce tries to turn, but he can't see over his shoulder. Who are you? The man removes his hood, revealing his face. My name's Turn. I'm here to save you and liberate Gotham. He tells the former Batman. But Bruce doesn't think the boy's plan will work. He knows that they aren't the first to try an assault on Gotham. Hands up! The police yell as they enter the chamber. Weapons trained on the young assassin. But Turn just smiles pulling up his hood and putting his mask back on. Did I forget to mention who my father was? Suddenly the boy begins to grow bigger, his muscles bulging and his veins sticking out on his arms. With a roar of rage, he charges at the soldiers who open fire, but the bullets seem to have no effect. Turn attacks, his blows cleaving the men in half, each punch breaking bones, each blow taking a man's life. And finally the soldiers lay dead around him with the boy returning to his normal size. I'm sure you're wondering where the tubes are, among other things. Turn informs him that his body produces the venom toxins naturally, the strange side effect of his father's constant use of the drug. The boy begins to cut Bruce free of the machine, the son of Bane and the one true bat teaming up to save Gotham. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? In the city streets, the fighting continues, but suddenly Saint Batman and his followers descend from the shadows. Saint Batman's claws slash and stab as Cardinal's machine gun fires rounds into the assaulting armies. In the heat of the battle, Jean-Paul could hear a voice whispering in his ear. You can feel it as we yell. The tactics, the assaults designed to exhaust you. You are losing control. The ghostly voice from the past hisses, just as you did before. Where they tug the warrior's neck snaps in St. Batman's hands and he looks on at the battle. 
I will not fail. He gasps, falling to his knees. His men move to help him, but Valley waves them away when suddenly the comms begin to bark, and Madeline informs him that one of the explosions took out the retaining wall on the eastern coast. A portion of the city is starting to sink, she tells him. He turns back to his men, ordering them to take and hold the cathedral, and he activates the venom once more, feeling strong. I must deliver Gotham from ruin. Beneath the city, Turn is carrying Bruce through the sewers on his back. Did you ever beat him? Bruce asks, speaking of Bane. Memories of synced Batman piercing Bane's chest with a blade flashing through his mind. Another seizure then pulses through Bruce's remains, and Turn is forced to put him down. Did he really amputate your limbs one every year? Saint Batman has conviction. Besieged by weakness, a voice calls out, and from the shadows, Lady Shiva steps out. Hello, Bruce. Propping him up against the wall, Shiva stands over her once enemy. And she reminds him that a lifetime ago, he came to her wishing to train to reclaim his city. I return now to finish what we started. Why? Shiva tells him that Gotham has always been a beacon under Batman's protection. When you fell, when Gotham fell, something broke. If the world could see Batman fighting alongside the son of his worst enemy, the world can stand again. Shiva places a glowing device on the ground by Bruce, pressing a button. From the box, a cloud of stringed black begins to rise. I have the means to give your body back. The only question is, do you still have the will to become the Batman that the city needs? On the east coast of the city, Saint Batman stands, surveying the destruction. He leaps into the water, swimming deep into the swirling darkness, and one of the support pillars begins to fall. He presses hard, trying to push it back into place. The great Azriel, reduced to this, a ghost voice calls to him. He turns, seeing the ghostly image of Saint Dumas wavering in the darkened waters. Tell me, Jean-Paul, is this truly the way that it ends? The pillar shifts, beginning to topple and crush Valley beneath it. I've always been here, Jean-Paul, in your moments of great weakness to watch you fail. But the anger begins to course through Valley as he pushes the button to activate his venom intake. I am the one true Batman. He snarls, lifting the pillar. Even your time is as real. You never lived up to the mantle, Dumas tells him. You are a failure, an imitation. With a final shove, Saint Batman pushes the pillar back into place, saving this part of the city. I have saved the wall. I've stabilized the wall. You are wrong, Dumas. I have succeeded. But the voice continues. Yet you will die in the same way that you lived. Suddenly the venom isn't enough, and the darkness begins to overtake Jean-Paul as he sinks deeper into the water. Weak, unfulfilled, another man's placeholder. Hands suddenly dip beneath the waters, pulling Saint Batman free. The torchbearer and the cardinal look down upon their master, pulling free his helmet, allowing him to breathe. Valley doesn't take long, though, demanding to know what happened to the cathedral. They tell him that the cathedral was secured, but the fighting continues in the streets. It'll be a long fight, but that is for another day, the torchbearer tells him. But Saint Batman struggles to his feet. No, we will not yield. All I require is a boost. Later, the pair dragged the weakened valley to the Damas house. And in the cave below, every hour that passes, our enemy gains confidence. The city needs its saint, he tells them, directing them to his venom cabinet. But opening the drawer reveals it empty, all the venom having disappeared. Lose something? It happens to the best of us. Turn calls out from behind them, and Valley stares at the intruders, his breathing labored. Shiva and the spawn, I should have guessed. He demands to know how they found the cave, but Madeline appears behind him. She goes to him, her hands reaching for him lovingly, explaining that she can no longer stand by his side and aid a cause that she does not believe in. For a moment, Jean-Paul stares at the woman that has been by his side for decades. Very well, he tells her, and shock pulls across the woman's face as she feels the blades of the cardinal's gauntlet piercing her back. She falls, blood pooling beneath her, and then Valley turns to the intruders. You invaded my city. You broke into my home. You turned my wife. Your death will not be swift. The two get ready for a fight as Turn pumps himself up. The torchbearer steps forward, igniting the sword in his hands. A child and a woman against us? You must all be mad. They're not alone. A voice snarls in the shadows. They have me! Batman calls from the dark ceiling of the cave, his body regrown and the nanites swirling around him like tiny bats. Valley stares up at the dark savior of Gotham, screaming, 
Bruce, no! Slaughter them all! Shiva smiles, pressing a button, blowing up the computer, throwing their opponents to the floor. Turn steps forward, his body now massive with venom, and he lifts Jean Paul to his feet, telling him that tonight it was designed to weaken him, exhaust him. I've been waiting a long time to kill you, he tells the saint. But Valley raises his hand, throwing Turn off with Sonics built into the gauntlets. Pain rips through his body as Turn throws his enemy away, crumpling to the ground. Shiva leaps forward, kicking Valley across the face, and elsewhere the Torchbearer tries to pull Cardinal to his feet. But a cloud of nano bats swarm into him, ripping him off his feet, carrying him through the cave. They crash through the ceiling and into the darkness of the manor above, and quickly the Cardinal tries to follow. But the nano bats swarm around him as the voice of Batman fills his ears. Your saint told me that I needed stronger codes. I can see it now. I see what must be done. He tells him and the Cardinal swings his wrist blades trying to cut through the swarm. But as the cloud lessens, he sees the torchbearer before him. The Cardinal stares down at the blood that glistens on his blades and at his friend's head, laying next to his body. The Cardinal screams in terror as the nanobats begin to swarm again. And in the cave below, Shiva and Saint Batman are locked in combat. She rains blows down on Jean-Paul, trying to finish the job, but they're distracted as the body of the Cardinal falls next to them. Using this moment as a distraction, Jean-Paul backhands her away, and he struggles to his feet, moving to the body of Turn. I have become reliant on Venom. In time, I will abstain, but tonight I will find a new source. He reaches down, his clawed hands grasping the arm of Turn. And with a vicious snarl, he rips it free of Turn's body, blood spewing around the chamber. He throws Turn aside and begins to drink the venom-laced blood dripping from the arm. He smiles as the new energy begins to course through his body. Much better. He charges across the room, his fist slamming into Shiva, but suddenly, the swarm of nanobats is there, taking the image of Batman. Your time is over, Sean Paul. He hisses, and behind him, Turn struggles to his feet, discovering the bladed gauntlet of Jean-Paul's Azrael armor. Jean-Paul reaches out for the solid form of Bruce, fighting against the swarm. You have no idea what I believe, Bruce. You never did. But Bruce sets off a taser, giving him and Shiva a moment of escape. The Jean-Paul struggles to his feet, quickly charged by Ben. I am the Batman of faith! He breaches, reaching out and lifting the giant penny over his head. But you... The only thing that ever motivated you was fear. He throws the penny, launching it across the room, flattening Batman and Shiva. He then lifts a boulder over his head, crossing the room to finish Bruce and Shiva off. I am too strong to fail. You are always destined to lose, to break, to fall aside in favor of the one true Batman. And then he stops as a blade pierces his chest. The rock tumbles and Valley falls to his knees. Behind him, Turn grabs his body, bringing his knee hard into the man's spine, breaking his back. The heroes stand over their fallen enemy. It's over. You lost. Turn tells him as Jean-Paul can do nothing more than moan. Turn turns and looks at Shiva. Now they can reopen the city and reconnect Gotham to the world. They can give the world hope again. The world is broken. It's way too late for that. Batman tells them. Turn and Shiva turn to him, confused. What are you saying, Bruce? But Batman's eyes burn as the nanites swarm around him. You came here to save the city, to reconnect Gotham, to heal the wounds, but some wounds don't heal. Sometimes they have to be made new. It must take care of itself. What's good for the world is not good for Gotham. The nanite bats swarm attacking Shiva and Turn, ripping them to pieces. And in the quiet of the cave, Batman stands over Jean-Paul, admitting that Jean-Paul was right that he kept Gotham standing. But his biggest mistake was relying on anyone like himself. But now, I'll never have to do it again. Batman tells him with an evil smile crossing his face. Gotham is mine, and I am hers. Tempest Fugonaut looks on at this dark world, realizing that there is no aid to be found here, casting his gaze elsewhere. The last view of this dark and broken world is Batman standing over the crucified body of Azrael and the people of Gotham cheering him below. There is no hope for crisis here. Tempest Fugonaut watches the crumbling earths of the dark multiverse, and he turns his watchful eyes upon another world. On our world, a crisis was stopped only when some of the greatest heroes from the new earth and those that had fallen had come together. On this earth, only one hero saw the crisis before it arrived, Ted Kord. 
but he was killed before he could act. Yet, what would happen if Ted Kord did not die? Tempest turns his eyes to an Earth where these events have played out. The hand of the Omac drone grasps Ted around the throat, choking him. He's flung carelessly across the room, cracking hard into a wall. Falling to the ground, he slips into darkness. And when he awakes, he's restrained, kneeling in a dark room with blood dripping out of his mouth as he struggles to his feet. This is why I want you, Ted. You never back down. Maxwell Lord tells him from across the room, a smile upon his face. He crosses the room, telling Ted about how he has ages across the world and the Brother One satellite in the sky. And then he sighs, standing, pulling out his pistol. All I want is to put Earth's destiny in the hands of humans, not the people pretending to be human. You want me to join you? That's why you're telling me all of this join or die time? Ted asks, and Maxwell Lord nods, aiming his pistol at Ted's head. That's it exactly. Ted lowers his head and he agrees. Fine, you win, I'll join. Maxwell smiles, lowering his pistol, and he orders the AI known as Brother Eye to release Ted from his restraints. Ted stands quickly, swinging the heavy metal restraints and cracking Maxwell Lord across the face. That sounds great, Max! He picks up the fallen weapon, aiming it at Maxwell Lord's face, but the villain just smirks. He's known Ted for years and knows that he will not pull the trigger. That gunshot echoes through the room as Maxwell falls to the ground, a look of frozen shock remaining on his face. Brother One begins to sound the alarm and Ted turns to the monitor, trying to reason with the machine. You're smart, aren't you? More than smart, you're sentient? He asks. He tells the computer to search its databases for Ted Cord. He wants the computer to see the man that he is. Maxwell Lord promised you that you would help save the world and I can help you do that. A voice then sounds from behind him and Ted turns to see Sasha Bordeaux, the Black King. Ted reasons with her and tells her that Maxwell had the right idea. The world has gone dark and it needs heroes, needs saving. Will you help me, Sasha? Through a viewer in another reality, a group watches the scene unfold. That's the spirit, Superman whispers. Two weeks pass and Booster Gold is running through the halls of the Justice League Watchtower on the moon. He charges into the control room, demanding to know where Blue Beetle is. Wonder Woman, Superman, and Batman all turn, demanding to know what Booster is even talking about. He yells at them, telling them that Blue Beetle came to each of them with intel that he had uncovered, and they each blew him off. You should think for a second about who you're threatening, Booster. Batman warns him, but Booster finally storms out of the room, telling the team that whatever happens to Beetle is on their heads. He's not wrong, Clark, Diana states, turning to Superman. I know, Diana. Later, Batman meets with Sasha Bordeaux, his mole within the Checkmate organization, and she fills him in on what Ted has accomplished in the last two weeks. Using the Brother One satellite, Ted Kord has uncovered an international secret society of supervillains that are led by Lex Luthor. From there, he learned of a second rival group of supervillains and recruited them into Checkmate, creating his own Secret Six. He's been able to deduce the identity of their ringleader, Mockingbird, but give him a few days. He discovered that Jean Loring had gotten her hands on the Black Diamond of Eclipso, but he managed to take her and the diamond into custody, and then he sought out the wizard Shazam, asking how to control the power of the Spectre before he got out of control. This is unnerving, Sasha. You should have come to me sooner. This is too much power in the hands of someone not up to the challenge of wielding it. And from the shadows, a voice interrupts them. <laughs> Harsh, Batman. Ted steps out, telling Sasha to leave them be. Yes, Black King. She nods, and Batman looks on as Ted explains that the Justice League doesn't understand how bad things have gotten and how much worse they could have gotten. I need to speak with the League. We're going to want a voice in the process. With all due respect, that's not going to happen, Batman. This is my problem, not yours. Stick to Gotham City. Ted begins to walk out with Sasha shadowing. You're going to need to answer for the death of Max Lord. Batman growls and Ted stops turning to his former ally. Maybe it's time that Bruce Wayne answered for the large number of crimes you've committed in that cow. Or you can keep your distance and let me work, Bruce. The choice is yours. Later, Ted sits within Checkmate Castle in the Swiss Alps with Booster Gold standing before him. Behind him, the monitors of Brother Eye watch on. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you're all right. Ted tells him, and Booster is trying to figure out what is even going on. Ted, I got blown up, and when I came to, nobody had heard anything about whether you were alive or dead for weeks, Booster tells his friend. Quickly, Ted fills him in on the events that have taken place, about how he's doing work that is bigger than anything they've done before. You were the one that told me what made us special was that we were the little guys. That we weren't these high and mighty gods, Booster. Ted smiles, pulling his mask off to show Booster his face. Booster, it's still me. I'm still an ordinary guy. That's what this is all about. 
he tells him. Booster pulls off his own mask, his face showing concern for his friend. The Ted I've known would be scared of the power that you've consolidated here. He would have never gone this far. The Ted tries to make his friend understand. Understand how close they came to a crisis unlike any the Earth has seen before. The Justice League were too busy fighting with each other to even notice, but I did. And now I'm doing something about it because I'm the only one who can. You sound like Max. You know that, right? Booster points out, and for a moment, anger flashes across Ted's face, and he seems to be masked in the shadows. I am nothing like Maxwell Lord. Maxwell was going to make this so much worse, and that's why I had to kill him. Shock crosses Booster's face as he looks at his friend, but once again, Ted tries to ask Booster to join his cause, to help him uncover the identity of the Mockingbird. But Booster pulls back on his mask, opening up one of the high windows in the castle. Sounds like you've got it under control. He tells his friend as he flies away. Later, Ted flies the bug airship through the Arctic, his checkmate squad behind him, and he calls over his shoulder, zeroing in on the Mockingbird's signal. We need to keep focus. Using the bug's lasers, they blast a hole in the secret base's ceiling, and they fast rope descend inside. The team moves quick and quiet, weapons at the ready, and Ted rounds a corner, stopping short in surprise. Lex Luthor is laying on the ground in front of him, dead. His neck twisted around at a strange angle, and nearby, Deathstroke is in a similar position. Oh God, Sasha gasps. Something ripped Black Adam in half. Ted nods, telling her that he doesn't know anyone on Earth powerful enough to do that. This Earth, perhaps, a voice calls as the door opens to reveal Lex Luthor. The team aims their weapons, surprised to see that there are now two Lex Luthers, and suddenly a blur passes through the room and Ted looks to find his entire team dead. How? You murdered them all! He gasps, and the blur stops revealing an angered Superboy. It's all your fault! You ruined everything! He yells, eyes burning with anger. Lex warps, revealing his true appearance. My name is Alexander Luther, he tells Ted as he begins to float. I am the son of Lex Luthor of a world once designated Earth-3. Quickly, Alex tells Ted of the former crisis, of their plan to remake the world as it should be, to create a perfect Earth. You would end billions of lives? Ted asks, staring at the two of them in shock. As they gloat, a voice echoes in Ted's head and his brother Eye asking for Ted to give him autonomous control so that he can eliminate the two of them. No, stand down, brother Eye, so I can handle this, Ted thinks. And finally, he turns to Luther, explaining that he can create the perfect Earth if he had their power. In a few weeks, I've done more to build a better world than you've done in years. And if I had your kind of firepower, I could make it count. I could make it last. Alexander raises an eyebrow to him. Do you really think that you can berate me into giving up? Ted shakes his head, looking over the man's shoulder. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person with the power to save the world. Alexander turns, surprised to see Superboy considering the hero's offer. He's right, Alex. You've been playing dress up with supervillains while I've actually been helping people. Superboy snarls, and Alex smiles, his arm transforming into a kryptonite cannon. I was always expecting that I'd have to finish this myself. Suddenly, the group is interrupted as two people walk in, and Ted looks on at the elderly versions of Superman and Lois. Pity. You would have been useful in what was going to come next, but I suppose it was always going to end this way. Alexander sighs, turning the cannon on the pair and firing. The radiation hits the elderly Superman and Lois, burning their skin from their bones and killing them instantly. Superboy screams in anger, turning his heat vision on Alexander and incinerating him. Ted stares at the smoking corpse as Superboy runs over, cradling the remains of his two friends. They were so good, Ted. They were so much better than the rest of us. Ted comes over, putting his hand on the young man's shoulder. I promise you, we'll make a world that this Superman would be proud of. He then orders Superboy to bring the Monitor's tuning fork back to the Checkmate Castle. And in his control room, he has Brother Eye interfacing with it. I want you to compile the greatest threats to the safety of the Earth. Tell me who we need to stop to put the world at peace. The Eye looks on from the screen, processing the data, and finally an image appears and Ted opens his eyes in surprise. The image shows that the greatest threat to this world is the Justice League standing proud. The greatest threat to the Earth are the costumed vigilantes calling themselves superheroes, Brother Eye tells him. But Ted doesn't believe him, yelling at the machine and pounding his fists against the controls. Decrease the superhero population by 50% and you decrease the threats by 50%. The math is complete and absolute. The most peaceful Earths in the multiverse feature no costumed vigilantes, Brother Eye tells him in a cold, calculated voice. Ted stops arguing, rubbing his neck. Then show me, damn it! just show me. 
Hours pass and Ted finally radios to Superboy in orbit, who's been watching the heroes of Earth, his mind twisted and angry as Ted's voice calls out to him. I need you to take out a target for me and then round up the teen heroes of Earth. He tells him, can you handle yourself? Superboy smiles, his eyes glowing with heat. Yeah, can you? Later, Superman flies to the ruins of the Justice League Tower, where he can find no sign of Jean. He floats back down, joining Batman, who holds the tower's black box, and Diana comes walking in, and the trio mention that they believe that they know who's behind the attack. You can't believe that all of this was him, Diana asks her comrades. Ted Kord is involved. We should have acted to dismantle Checkmate the second he started making threats, Batman growls. But Superman stops them, cocking his head to the side. Something's wrong. I can hear screaming in Kansas. Over in San Francisco, the Teen Titans rush out of their tower, with Connor and Kent falling out of the sky, cracking the concrete. You know, I'm not supposed to hurt any of you unless you resist. Superboy calls out from above, a dark smile on his face. I'm begging you, please resist. The Titans turn, launching themselves at this villain. And on the moon, Ted leaps from the shadows, now clad in armor that he made from the dead anti-monitor. He orders Brother Eye to attack Batman first, and he fires a blast, which Wonder Woman quickly deflects, but Ted Kord moves around her, knocking Batman back before turning and firing a blast of kryptonite at Superman. He tells them, I'm not trying to kill any of you. I'm recruiting. I want to assure you that you'll be a part of what's next. Energy crackling off of Ted. Superman struggles to his feet. Even with new power, you can't defeat all of us, he tells him. But Ted just smiles. Like I said, I'm recruiting. The heroes look down, shocked as the nanites from Brother Eye begin to crawl up their bodies. I've tailored the original OMAC nanovirus to each of your genetic structures. I'm afraid there's no fighting back at this point. Completely overtaken, the three new OMAC drones stand before their master. And with their task complete, Ted radios to Superboy on Earth. Little busy here! Superboy yells back, throwing another hero as he turns his heat vision and melts the flesh of Kid Flash. They resisted, he tells Ted. Superboy lashes out, killing another hero with a punch, and suddenly he looks down as the nanites are crawling up his skin. What have you done? He screams. You weren't supposed to hurt anybody, Superboy. And if you can't be trusted to follow commands, you'll be assimilated with the rest of them. Ted tells him, already arriving on the scene with his OMAC drones. The drones leap into the fight, engaging with the remaining heroes. Omax, deploy the nanovirus, assimilate all costumed heroes. I want as few casualties as possible. He turns on the battlefield though, as a voice calls out his name. Booster Gold lands amongst the carnage as the other heroes enter the fight behind him. That does not sound like the man that I've known for years. The man who doesn't have acceptable casualties. Ted turns, trying to explain to his friend. But the Brother Eye satellite turns, watching the scene, and it requests that Ted give up the emotional centers of his brain so that he will think more rationally. Ted, the thing is in your mind, it's twisting you. It's making you into something you never would have recognized. Booster tries to explain to his friend. You don't understand, Ted yells, explosions erupting behind him. This is about stopping a crisis in its tracks! Booster nods, raising the pistol in his hand and aiming it at his friend, Ted Cord. It's exactly what this is about. He whispers, I'm so sorry. But Brother Eye activates the defense in Ted's new suit, shooting a laser that pierces Booster Gold's chest. He runs to his fallen friend, cradling the dead hero in his arms, screaming as the heroes of the world all fight around him. The work remains unfinished. You cannot act in your current state. You must allow me to fully interface with your mind. I will remove your emotional center. Brother I tells him through their link. Ted lowers his head. Yes, Bruce would understand. I need to do this for him. Ted suddenly jerks back, dropping the body of Booster Gold, and he stands up. Oh, Max, lethal force is sanctioned. End the battle, it is time that we take the planet. The words of Brother Eye echoing out of Ted's mouth, and Tempest Fugonaut watches as the heroes are killed. The OMAC drones patrol the planet, now ruled by the being formerly known as Ted Korn. He watches as in the dark multiverse, Ted becomes his world's greatest villain. Tempest Fugonaut stands, staring out into the vastness of the multiverse. He is the guardian against the dark multiverse, and he can see the multiverse spinning around him, feeling its warm light. But now there is a darkness. Worlds are wrapped in this writhing darkness. Why does it always return, he questions. No matter what they do, the darkness always comes back. It feeds upon worlds, breaking stories, poisoning them. 
None of these stories are safe, not even the greatest of stories. And he looks to a world seeing a Superman fighting to the death with the mighty Doomsday. He falls, as he always does, and the woman he loves runs to his side, holding him in the last moments of his life. Lois Lane stares into the sky, her eyes close as tears are spilling out, and her eyes open again, but they're filled with anger as she looks around at the heroes that have gathered. Now, when they have already failed the greatest among them, you have failed him, she whispers, and Batman steps forward, trying to offer words of comfort. He needed you, and you failed him. She turns, her words spitting froth in anger. You let him die alone! Where were you? Where were any of you? Days pass and Metropolis is silent with the funeral of its greatest protector. Lois watches on as the heroes stand front and center. They weren't there when Superman died, but they're there now because they loved to be seen. She stands in the crowd, tears in her eyes, barely able to see the ceremony. And she watches as they pull free the cloth, revealing the golden statue of the Man of Steel. She barely hears the words of Lex Luthor, one of Superman's greatest enemies. And she sees all of this knowing that Superman would be disgusted by it. She walks throughout the city, passing merchants as they try to make money off of Superman's death. And for a brief moment, she thinks that maybe his death will change things. Yet, a few weeks later, she's sitting at her desk in the Daily Planet reading the headlines. She knows that nothing has changed. The world is moving on without their Superman, so she goes to visit Martha in Smallville, seeing the people who raised him, who couldn't even go to their own son's funeral. Jonathan was in the hospital. His heart was failing after watching his son die. And she cries, and Lois does her best to console her. Time passes, and Lois finally journeys to the fortress in the far north. She walks inside, standing before the great statues of Clark's Kryptonian parents. And in the darkness of the fortress, the robots buzz around, seemingly lost. Tears fill her eyes as she places the tattered cape beneath the statues. The only thing that his parents could spare to send with him. Well, suddenly, a loud explosion rocks the fortress and Lois is thrown to the icy floor. No! No! A voice screams as energy cracks around the room. I am too late! The being is made of pure energy and it flies into the room and Lois looks up at this glowing being. Who are you? She asks. The Eradicator, protector of Krypton, reborn to defend the last son of the House of El. He explains that he took Kal-El's body from his tomb and placed him into a Kryptonian life matrix to re-energize his cells. But he was too late. He truly is gone. I have failed him. He tells her, and she nods agreeing that they have both failed the Man of Steel. So the Eradicator roars in pain as the energy from the life matrix burns within him. He tells her that he cannot contain the power. There must be a Kryptonian. Lois stares up at the being to determination suddenly appearing in her eyes, pushing past the tears. Use me, she tells him. And the Eradicator looks stunned at her. He knows that Lois's body can't handle the power, but she begs him, telling him that she loved Clark. You wish to carry on his battle? No, I wish to end it, she tells him. So the Eradicator reaches out, taking Lois's hand, with energy coursing through her body. The fortress explodes, crumbling inward, and from the rubble, a being of energy leaps into the air. Lois rockets into orbit, tying Superman's tattered cape around her shoulders as her body is pulsing with pure energy. She looks down at her hands in awe, and then at the Earth below her. And in that moment, she makes a promise to Clark to make a better world, one that would have deserved his protection. She rockets back towards the earth, ready to get started. But instead of stopping bank robbers, she stops banks. She ends wars in countries, freeing prisoners as she tears fences from the ground and destroys the buildings. She rains food upon those who are starved and punishes those who would starve them. Her eyes burn, melting the weapons and destroying the ones who make them. But everywhere she goes, she still finds death and destruction. She looks beneath to the cause of that problem, and her vision finds Luther's name on everything. And in that moment, anger fills her eyes, and she knows she is not Clark. In Metropolis, Lex is pouring himself a glass of wine, and he turns to see Lois floating outside his window. Will, we all grieve differently. 
He notes. I know it's you, Lex. I know what you've done, she tells him, but he smiles, asking her, be more specific. He tells her of regional conflicts he started to up his profits, a vaccine shortage to push up his stocks. He laughs about getting around the climate regulations. And then he turns his smile almost deeper. I've got his cousin on my leash. I routed every dollar of the Tomorrow Foundation to fund child soldier militias. Oh, and I murdered my secretary on the way home from the funeral. Just to let him know that I could. And I won. But he continues to gloat. Because he knows that Lois can't prove any of this. Just like Superman couldn't. So maybe it's time that you learn what he did a long time ago and go save a cat from a tree. Suddenly, Lois's fist crashes through the windows, wrapping around Luther's neck. She pulls him free, lifting him into the air, tears in her eyes. He was Clark Kent, she tells him, and Luther looks at her shocked. She rockets them up and out of the Earth's atmosphere, their bodies bursting into flames. She is flying so fast. And as they reach the darkness of space, Luther is no more than ash in her hands and drifts into the void. She knows that she should feel bad, but she doesn't. So she begins her work, dismantling LexCorp, Intergang, the League of Shadows, Cadmus, but she doesn't stop. She goes after the killers, Ra's al Ghul, Black Adam, Victor Zaz, Deathstroke, Parasite. One by one, they fall. Laughter echoes through the dark rooftops of Gotham City, and the Joker turns, looking over his shoulder when suddenly Lois is before him, her eyes burning with anger. She says no words and the Joker is burned to ash before her. Lois, what have you done? Batman questions, landing on the rooftop behind her. What you never could. How many have died from him? Batman tries to explain to her that there are certain lines that they can't cross, but anger fills her voice as she tells him, you're wrong. It's always the same with you people for years. People are dying and it's just a game to you. Can't you see how pathetic you are? You are all failures. Batman stops staring at her. Was Clark a failure? Lois looks away. He's dead. And if he's dead, they don't get to live. I won't let him die in vain. You already have, Bruce tells her. But she lashes out, knocking him away with a lightning fast blow. Batman flies across the rooftop, cracking concrete as he lands, and he reaches for the kryptonite in his belt, but she's too fast, knocking it away. Don't, she tells him. Do you have any idea how much he held back? But Batman punches out, catching her with a taser that knocks her back. He struggles to his feet, clutching at his broken ribs. Lois stands over him, telling him that Clark always pitied Bruce. How he wanted him to stop. Batman turns, ready to attack again. I don't stop. No, you don't. And her eyes burn, and for a brief moment, the Gotham rooftops are bathed in light. Lois flies away, leaving the city of Gotham behind. She continues to fix the world, and then the imposters come. The clone, the man in the suit, but she knows that they don't matter. Only one matters, the one claiming Clark's name. Lois screams across the skies over Metropolis, finally meeting this cyborg Superman. Morning, Lois, what I miss? He asks, his voice so close to Clark's that it's creepy. You're not him. She states simply, and the imposter stares at her for a moment before dropping the facade. No, I'm not. I had a whole story ready to go, but you're too smart for that, aren't you? He admits, and she yells at him, demanding that he take the symbol off, that he doesn't deserve it. Oh, and you do? I know you have blood on your hands. You're not trying to honor the Man of Steel's legacy. You're trying to burn it down. Starting with Metropolis, he snarls, and wires and robotics suddenly explode out of the buildings around them with Lois wrapped up. You changed the world, Lois, but you weren't enough. Now that he's left you all alone. <laughs> I don't know, Superboy suddenly calls over his shoulder as Steel brings his hammer across the cyborg's face. You look pretty outnumbered to me. Steel moves in to help free Lois as Superboy takes on the cyborg, but she yells at the armored man, telling him to help the young clone. I'm more powerful than the real Superman, Cyborg tells him. Catching the young boy's fist, don't waste my time. The blast in the cyborg's eye beam melts into Superboy, setting him ablaze. So Steel tries to help him, but Cyborg Superman raises his hand, crushing the metal suit. Lois screams, ripping her way free of the robotics that are holding her, and she blasts into Cyborg Superman with her heat vision, throwing him through a building. Angered, she rushes at him, but the blow knocks her away, and then the two go back and forth. Time passes, and the destruction is all around them. And she knocks him away again, destroying another building. But that's when she hears it. People running and screaming as the rubble falls on them. 
but a voice calms them as he catches it. It's all right, I'm here, Superman tells them, reassuring them in a way that only he can. She watches this man in his dark suit with his long mullet. He's weak, straining to throw the debris to safety, but she knows that it's him. She floats before him and Clark looks at her, stunned. Lois, how are you? How are you? She begins to ask, but Clark shakes his head. He doesn't know. The Eradicator placed him into the life matrix and it just took longer than he expected. But I'm back now. He looks around and he sees the people stare at Lois in fear. They're afraid of you. Why are they afraid of you, Lois? The two stare at each other for a moment before they're interrupted. Wow, I don't believe it. How many people get to die twice? Cyborg Superman asks, aiming a kryptonite cannon at Superman. Lois launches herself, anger fueling the energy in her body, and she bashes through the cannon, destroying it, releasing the kryptonite into the air. I won't let you take him from me again! She screams, and the kryptonite gas hits her. Her human side helps her survive as she fights through the cloud, finding Clark lying on the pavement. She holds him, looking into the eyes of the man that she loves, and they stare back at her with terror. Tears fill her eyes as she whispers for him to hold on, but once again, the Man of Steel dies in her arms. Tempest Fugonaut watches as Lois is cradling the dying Superman, vowing to create a world that deserved him. He sees her eyes burn, for Lois is now the Eradicator, the dark avenging angel of the multiverse beyond salvation. Fugonaut looks out over the multiverse, over the darkness that has seeped in. He feels pity for those who have fallen prey to the dark, for he knows that they must cherish the light that they have. Fugonaut Tempest looks around the dark multiverse at the myriad of darkness that prevails in the shadowy realm, and once again he turns his gaze upon a single world. When the dark god Necron unleashed the power of the Black Lanterns upon the galaxy, it took the power of the White Lantern to turn back the tide of death, and only Sinestro agreeing to share that power to create a new White Lantern core caused the defeat of Necron. But on this world, the events played out much differently. In this universe, when the moment came for Sinestro to share his godlike powers, he refused. But he was not enough to stop the Black Lanterns alone. So the Lantern Corps fell, and the wave of darkness washed over the universe. And with each death, the ranks of the Black Lanterns grew. And in the war of life and death, life lost. Seeing this and knowing that it was his fault, Sinestro could not live with himself and he placed the ring against his head and he took his own life. And now 19 days have passed. Lobo's boot crushes the skull of the Black Lantern at his feet and more of the monsters encircle him with the main man swinging his hook and chain. Behind him, Dove cowers in the corner. Out of all the places in this scumball planet, you had to be here. He growls, and more of the Black Lantern Teen Titans close in, but Lobo keeps them all at bay. Starting to think you might not be worth the scratch, little chicky. I shouldn't have come to Titan's Tower, Dove whispers. I just didn't know where else to go. I for one am happy to see you, Dove. A voice calls out from over her shoulder, and the young hero turns to see the undead Cyborg behind her. She begins to back up as Cyborg tries to lure her in. So Lobo grabs the former hero, ripping him apart. Starfire leaps onto him, sinking her teeth into his neck, but he tosses her aside. Now you listen here, Starbutt! You take a bite out of me, you get a gut ache like you ain't ever had. He tosses his chain, letting the hook sink into her stomach, and then he rips her apart. The Black Lantern ring floats in front of him as the bite wound begins to pulse. Lobo of Caesarea, die! It commands, but the wound heals almost instantly and the ring is forced to fly away. Nope, he spits. Caesareans can replicate their cells whenever they feel like it. Works real nice for infections. Yet in that moment, the Titans close in and it seems as if Lobo will actually fall, but the undead suddenly fall to the ground as a voice calls out. Cassandra Sandsmark of Earth, Victor Stone of Earth, Garfield Logan of Earth, Bart Allen of Earth, LIVE! They fall as the white light pulls over them, and through the glare, Lobo looks up to see Sinestro the White walking forward. He is clad in both white and black. While half his face looks as it always has, the other half is sunken and decayed. After a time, Black Lanterns become used to the numbness of death. My white ring reminds them how much life can hurt. Respite is brief, though. 
as the black ring on his other hand commands them to die once again. The brief moment of life that returned to the heroes is enough to make them cry for death before the black rings can take them over again. Rebirth and death, over and over again, as long as I will it. Sinestro notes over their anguished cries. Dove steps forward, asking that Sinestro cease her pain that he is causing her former friends. Heard you a rock in a yellow ring, Sinestro. Looks like you're a half heart muncher. Lobo tells the man as Dove notes that the white ring keeps the infection of the black ring at bay. Either way, you're gonna tell me what brings you here, Sinestro, before I put a boot up to my knee in your bifurcated butt! Sinestro nods, motioning towards Dove. Quite simply, her. She is Dove, the avatar of peace. I detected her with my white ring. She is quite literally the last living woman on Earth. He steps to the young woman, telling her that he would like to run some tests as to why she is immune to the influence of the Black Rings. It's possible that her powers are the key to ending this plague. But Lobo is there, pushing Sinestro away. Yeah, and I'd like to kill every loser in my entire home planet a second time, but that ain't gonna happen, because what's done is done. He spits, and Lobo leans in close, telling Sinestro that Dove is coming with me. I was hired to bring her to Tacron Galtos. The prison planet, by who? Didn't say, don't care. Sinestro pauses, staring at the Caesarean for a moment before turning away. It's just as well. Perhaps your patron has some insight into her importance and is willing to share his or her resources. If not, there's always torture. He stops nearby, motioning to Lobo's space hog that is parked among the destruction and debris of the tower. I suppose this monstrosity is yours? Her name's Ramona, and don't you get your grape grease on her. Lobo growls, so Dove steps forward as if the men have completely forgotten about her. You two thugs think that you can talk about me like I'm not even here? The Lords of Order and Chaos chose me to bear these powers, and I've survived on my own for weeks in this hell. No one tells me where to go, she tells them. From behind her, though, the fallen titans call out to her, asking her to join them. She looks over her shoulder at her former friends, at the destruction of Earth around her. Just get me the hell out of here, she whispers to Lobo, moving towards his space hog. The bike roars into space with Lobo grumbling the whole way. Fragging bastards, bossy chicky. They move through the solar system quickly, avoiding the remains of the Vanagarian fleet that was sent to try and stem the tide of the Black Lanterns. Sinestro warns the two of the wave of 19 million Black Lanterns that moves throughout the universe, devouring worlds and swelling its own ranks. It takes six days for the three of them to travel through the vast emptiness of space. Rise and shine, barnacles! Lobo calls from the front, rousing Dove from her sleep. We've arrived at Tacron Galtos for a door-to-door -door delivery, main man style. The prison world lays below them, a sprawling metropolis of buildings and smokestacks that billow dark clouds into space, and on his hand, the white ring begins to pulse and glow. I feel the presence of life here, but that singular heartbeat is overpowered by the extensive presence of death, Sinestro tells him. Lobo nods, checking his sensors. I say him. A body temperature that low means an army of refrigerators or black lanterns, he tells them, before anger washes over him. Frag! If this is a trap, there's gonna be a rended and tear and urinating down neck holes, he growls. But Dove is waiting. She knows that if someone is down there, they might need help. So she leaps from the bike, forcing Sinestro to follow her with a sigh. So infuriating and so familiar, I'm right behind you. Lobo looks around confused, still on his bike. Hey! Deal says I deliver the chicky. No one steals the main man's bounty. Especially not the damn bounty! He screams as he leaps free of the bike falling hard towards the building below. Passing the two others, he shatters through a window, and Sinestro and Dove follow as they move through the prison. Suddenly, Sinestro falls forward, groaning in pain, and the black ring on his finger glows and pulses. Something's wrong! The power of death here is stronger than any I faced! As if it's consumed by an even greater life, fed upon eternity itself. He turns, realizing what this means. New gods. The others turn to see the beings that have moved against them. Granny goodness, we have visitors. Big Barda says in the darkness, and behind her, the undead citizens of Apocalypse and New Genesis gather. Sinestro moves forward, raising his twin rings, but nothing happens. Well, do the only damn thing that makes it worth keeping your decaying ass around. But Sinestro grunts until he gives up. Even I can't restore a fallen god. Lobo steps forward, pulling back his hook and chain. Forget this crap! If I'm gonna be led into a trap, I'm at least gonna take some trophies. He growls, standing before the mightiest warriors of the new gods. And the head of Big Barter will look mighty good mounted on the hood of my car. But suddenly he's knocked aside as a new fighter emerges. Mr. Miracle stands before his fallen family, and he turns, ordering the three of them to run. 
Run! That way! Now! He commands. He turns with them, running through the prison as Big Barda and the others follow, calling for him to join them. The blast doors close behind them, and the sound of the dead pounding echoes throughout the rest of the hallways. The group takes a minute to breathe as Mr. Miracle turns to them to smile. It'll take them a few hours to get through. I would know. Master escape artist and all. Anyway, top-notch work, Lobo. Worth every penny, he tells the main man. You hired me? Dark side's goofy stepson? Lobo asks, surprised in his gruff voice. Miracle nods, pushing past the Caesarean to pull Dove into a hug. So glad to see you. It's been a while since, what, Superman's funeral? Those were the good old days, right? Quickly, Mr. Miracle explains that he brought Barda and her Furies to the prison planet. That he's been moving from cell to cell, avoiding them while waiting for Lobo to arrive. It's not so bad, really. Except for the constant screaming and threats. <laughs> but Lobo doesn't understand why he doesn't just boom tube them all to the heart of the black hole. And Sinestro moves forward understanding. Scott Freeman has a reputation of having one of the most cunning minds in the universe. I assume that you may have a plan, Mr. Miracle. Scott nods, tapping a few buttons on his computer, bringing up a hologram. And he tells them the legend of the wall at the edge of the known universe that is made of the corpses of giants that have once dominated prime evil space. The source wall. Sinestro notes, and Scott nods and continues. He explains that beyond that wall is the pure energy of creation, pure life. But he explains that the energy is chaotic and unfocused, and it takes the shape of its container. The heroes begin to watch these images before them, and thus the need for Dove, chosen as the avatar of peace by the Lord of Order. Sinestro finishes. Scott nods, believing that they can use both Sinestro's white ring and combine it with Dove to help focus the energy and wash pure life over the universe. With his explanation complete, Scott turns to Lobo, telling the man that he can leave. Great work, I'll be leaving a glowing review, he tells him. But Lobo steps up, his finger in Scott's face. If you yahoos mess this up, all my damn money won't be worth squat. I'm going. Consider protecting my investment, he tells them angrily. And later, after the group has prepared their journey, the boom tube opens up at the edge of space. God, Dove gasps, her eyes widening as she stares at the source wall before her. The faces of ancient giants stare back as the wall stretches out on their left and right. Nah, darling, you got it all wrong. Better make it plural, Lobo tells her, puffing on a cigar. Mr. Miracle moves quickly, explaining that once he opens up the boom tube through the source wall, Sinestra will channel the energy through Dove. Lobo, cover us. As Scott moves to attach the harness to Dove, Lobo watches the girl float through space and Sinestro turns, staring at Lobo. You got something to say, Hivecocked? You, the scourge of Caesarea, the most feared bounty hunter in the galaxy. You care for her, he tells the man, but Lobo just laughs it off. Ha <laughs> Even if I did, the main man always keeps his emotions in check, Lobo tells him. But the conversation is cut short as another boom tube opens. The black lanterns flood outward and Sinestro's eyes grow wide with shock and fear. Before him, the group of Black Lanterns emerges, and he knows their faces well, as each member of this Black Lantern Corps was once a member of the different Lantern Corps, and at the front of it, the fallen Hal Jordan stands next to Sinestro's own daughter. This is what happens when you let yourself feel hope, Sinestro, Hal taunts him. You immediately feel the opposite, fear. Fear that everyone will know that you were the one who failed the universe, that you're the one for the end of it all. But the former Lanterns are the only ones who have joined the fight as behind them emerges Darkseid, the new avatar for Lord Necron. I have become anti-life incarnate. Prepare yourselves for death, the Master of Apocalypse intones at them. Scott looks back at his former family, at his wife Barda. Dove is ready, trying to get his attention. Scott, this is our only chance. You need to focus while we fix this, she tells him, and Lobo launches himself through space towards the Black Lanterns. Lobo! Darkseid is possessed by Necron. Their power is immeasurable. Shut up and let me do my job. Lobo yells, his hook swinging and slicing through the undead, and he makes his way towards the Dark Master. Come at me, Lobo of Caesarea. You have always been a loyal servant, whether you knew it or not. He tells him. Omega beams launch from his eyes, striking Lobo and blowing him apart, his blood floating through space. And now you have received the gift of annihilation. Darkseid smiles. Sinestro stands against the might of the Black Lanterns, and raising his own ring, tendrils of barbed wire begin to wrap around him, slicing them apart. But Hal and Sorenik are behind him, their arms wrapping around him. Scott yells that they need him, and Sinestro turns the light of his white ring upon them. Sorenik not to of Korrigar, Hal Jordan of Earth, LIVE! The ring yells, and in the brief moment of the resurrection, Sinestro looks at one of his greatest enemies. Jordan, listen, I failed because I was selfish. Because instead of courage, I have fear. 
because I feared that you would always be better than me. And my failure killed my beloved daughter. My failure killed the universe. The ring pours its energy forward and suddenly Hal Jordan and Sorenix stand before Sinestro, reborn. Thal, you did it. Hal tells him, looking down at his own body in shock, but his words suddenly become screams of pain as the Black Ring infection overtakes him again. Sorenik looks at her father as her body decays, calling out to him, and Sinestro reaches out for her, when suddenly her head is ripped off her body. Enough of this lost cause! Lobo spits, having reformed. He turns, telling Sinestro to help Dove. I can't do this all by myself! Lobo tells him, but he turns, and the other cells of Lobo that have reformed have already launched into the fight with the Black Lanterns. Lobo launches himself at Darkseid again, ripping out his eyes. Now let's see you try and do that fancy eye beam without them baby reds. He snarls. Sinestro floats to the source wall, reaching out with his white ring. Dove's eyes go white as the energy of the source wall begins to pulse through her. I feel it! I feel the source of all creation! Sinestro orders Scott to unleash the energy, but it's too late. Stop, my son! Darkseid bellows appearing near them. Do this and I promise you will never see your wife again. Scott turns to his father, his finger hovering over the Boom Doob's activation button. Why would I listen to you, Darkseid? The great and mighty ruler of Apocalypse is nothing more than an ugly suit of Necron now. Darkseid's unseeing eyes seem to bore through Mr. Miracle. I've spent my life trying to eliminate free will. Necron found the solution. His word is the anti-life equation. But the power of the Avatar of Order will not reverse that. Instead, it will destroy it. Eliminate chaos as its nature. He turns to Sinestro, his black ring compelling the man to tell Scott the truth. Sinestro tries to fight it for a moment before confirming that the source energy will scour the universe and restart with a clean slate. It will wipe out everything. Scott realizes that he will live on, but in a universe without his wife. Dove turns to him, pleading to let this happen. Let this go through. We were chosen for this. It's our destiny, she tells him, but Scott can't. He can't live in a world without Big Bard. Sand reaches out, wrapping around Dove's neck. I'm sorry, he whispers, taking the life out of her with a snap. Lobo screams in anger, launching himself at Mr. Miracle, his fist punching through the new god's stomach, killing him instantly. I saw it in her, man! She was good and pure and peaceful! The only beautiful thing left in this damn universe! Now all there'll be is this friggin' ugliness. With the plan ended, Darkseid stands quietly with the lanterns and he reaches out his hand, offering Sinestra a place at his side. For a moment, fear passes Thal's face but suddenly he surges with the light of life. His body is healed as the darkness is expelled from him. I am will incarnate. I am life, and I refuse to fail again. The power of life pulses off of him, destroying the black lanterns around him. The life sources swirl around them, and Sinestro directs it through Lobo. In the place of Dub, you will direct the source energy. He yells, Lobo doesn't understand as he looks at Sinestro and behind him, Darkseid moves in for the kill, but in his last moments, Sinestro presses the button on the boom tube. This is my destiny. Creation will be remade in my image. Sinestro whispers. The creation wave rushes from the source wall, washing over them and destroying all in its path. And Lobo laughs as he disappears. The Black Lanterns try to flee, but they're destroyed in an instant. And across the universe, the Black Lantern plague is destroyed. Yet from this death, new life sprang. This new life grew quickly, taking on the shape of their creator in mere months. Sinestro watched as the galaxy is filled with those that were born of the energy of a Lobo. Those creatures took to the stars, destroying and conquering all before them. And Sinestro watches as the mistakes of his creation play out in front of him. He seeks to escape this reality, looking for a terror into another world. But it's just beyond his understanding. And Fuganot Tempest watches. Yet Tempest turns and walks away to look into the possibilities of another dark universe. Tempest Fugonaut turns, his staff batting away the strange creature of darkness. The monster swirls and it disappears, moving through the void between the dark multiverse. With the battle over, Tempest once again turns his gaze upon a world that has been overtaken by darkness. And in this world, the members of the Teen Titans fight against enemy soldiers. One of their newest members, Terra, uses her powers to manipulate the Earth to hurl dirt and stones at the soldiers, and the fight ends quickly. Later, 
the team finds themselves back at Teen Titans Tower. From the side room, a door opens revealing Wally West dressed in civilian clothes. It's that time, isn't it, Wally? I never expected you to be the first of the Titans to leave, Dick Grayson tells his old friend. Wally nods, telling the team that he needs to dedicate more time to college. The group hug and they say their goodbyes with Wally telling Donna that she better invite him to the wedding. Wally, don't go yet. I guess this is as good a time as any to make my announcement. Dick tells them and he looks at his friends before looking out into the night sky. I'm giving up on being Robin, he tells them. The group looks shocked as Dick removes his Robin mask, telling them, I'm done living in the shadow of Batman. As long as I wear the same costume that I've worn since I was eight, I'll keep playing the role that I've long outgrown, he tells them. He looks around the room, his eyes pausing on Tara. She stares at him and he thinks that he sees something in her eyes. But later he stops by her room asking if there's anything she'd like to talk about. That she might understand what he meant by stepping out of someone's shadow. Anger flashes across her face as she reels back. I'm nobody's sidekick, she tells him. Dick reels back trying to apologize for misunderstanding the look that she was giving him. He turns to leave but Tara quickly apologizes telling him that she is new to the whole team thing. I guess I'm just curious. He's Batman. Didn't you think that there were heaps that he could have taught you? Surely, but he can only teach you to be Batman, you know? Later, Deathstroke stands in his mansion with Tara leaning on the wall behind him. You've made a grave mistake, Tara, he tells her. I believe that inviting Batman's sidekick to speak with you has put your entire mission in danger. Relax, Slade. They still don't know that I'm a spy, she tells him, brushing off the worry. But Slade turns, telling her that she needs to be more cautious. She lashes out at him, accusing him of being soft, holding up pictures of his family that are scattered around the room. I'd caution some respect. He warns her. She begins to speak out again, stumbling back as Deathstroke's hand slaps her across the face and she stares her eyes wide in shock. A reprimand for forgetting your place, for not respecting your superior, he tells her. But shock turns to anger and the house begins to rumble around them as she shakes the earth and Slade is launched from the house, landing in the snow outside. Enough! This is foolish, child, he warns her. Nah, I actually reckon that this is the first smart thing I've ever done, she tells him, floating on a piece of rock. Slade dodges as she sends the stones and the earth at him and he tries to reason with her but she isn't listening. Before he can dodge again, he's trapped in the shackles of earth. See, a little bird says something to me that made a lot of sense, she says leaning in. You gotta craft your own destiny, Slade. Slade's one good eye opens wide as he sees the end coming. The potential of your power is near infinite, girl. You don't want to be controlled. You want to be free. I can teach you discipline. Nah, that's the thing. I'm done with discipline. The rocks pull tight and Slade's arm and head are ripped clean off his body. She marches back into the house, bursting through the front door. Oh, Wintergreen, she calls to Slade's butler. Moving through the house, she tries to find the former soldier, only to be surprised as he pops around at the corner with a gun. But she slices through his hand with the earth, sending him to the floor, and then she leans in close to the elderly man. The drugs that made Slade all super a destroke. He has spares, where are they? She demands to know. Wintergreen leads her through the house where Slade kept the drugs in case his powers ever depleted. Wintergreen helps her into the harness, trying to talk her out of her current course. You're doing an awful lot of yapping for the help, she tells him, ordering him to press the button, and as it's activated, the energy courses through her. She screams, falling to the ground. Stupid girl. Wintergreen spits, turning away from her fallen body, but suddenly the earth begins to rumble and he turns back. No, you shouldn't be alive. Slade was in a coma for weeks. He gasps. Tara smiles at him. Slade was just a man who never lived up to his potential. Hell, he couldn't even kill a bunch of kids. I'm so much more. Later at Titan's Tower, Raven looks up from her meditation. She senses the presence of her friends. Garth joins her as they both begin to look into the darkness of the stairs. Tara, that's the name Slade gave me. It means dirt and that ain't me. I'm not Earth. I am the Earth, Tara says walking into the light. Say hello to Gaia. Garth stands confused, but Raven finally understands. Tara was the spy. I should have trusted my instincts. It was evil I sensed in you, she tells her. Raven begins to move against her former friend, but Garth gets in the way, still not understanding. No, we can't hurt Tara! But Gaia laughs, using her power to launch herself away from the building, and as she floats over the bay, she looks back to see Teen Titans Tower destroyed by an erupting volcano. The next to fall was Donna Troy, who was launched into space. Cyborg and Starfire were both buried deep beneath the earth until they both suffocated. And later, Gaia shatters through the window of Dick Grayson's apartment. Oh boy, wonder you're home. Good. <laughs> 
Dick dumps away, startled by the attack, and she lashes out with a metal blade. Dick dodges, flipping out the window, moving away in the streets, and he quickly loses himself into the crowd in the park as Gaia floats behind him, trying to find him. Gotta admit, it's harder to find you in the crowd now that you've toned down your wardrobe. But there's a quick fix for that. The ground between the crowd begins to split open, dropping them into pools of lava. Dick Grayson rushes forward, yelling for her to stop over the screams of dying civilians. She lashes out again and Dick flips away, taking cover behind a tree as she launches sharp stones. He ducks, jumping as arms of Earth reach out for him and as he moves, Gaia taunts him with the deaths of his friends. Shock slowly fills him and the Earth arm encircles him, pulling him up to her level. But in a blur of emotion, Dick is gone and Gaia is talking to blank air. Close by, Wally comes to a stop, dumping Grayson on the ground. Wally! You're here, Dick asks, shocked. The tower, they're all gone. Tara killed them, Dick. Kid Flash tells his friend, but Wally reaches into his bag, pulling out the Robin costume. They don't have to beat Gaia. They just need to slow her down. I put a call into the big guy, Wally tells him. Okay, then we can do as Dick tells his friend with a nod. The two heroes leap from the bushes with Dick now clad in the Robin costume. Their attacks can't make it through Gaia's defense though, and as they leap into defeat her, twin blades of Earth pierce their chests. The two friends fall to the ground, gasping for air, and Wally reaches out, his fingers brushing against Robin's. Sorry, Dick. <sighs> I should have been faster. It's okay. We did it. He's here. Robin tells him, turning his eyes skyward as the life leaves his body. Tara Markov! Superman bellows as he lifts her off the ground. Enough! He lifts her into the sky with him. I don't know what hurt you, who hurt you, to make you lash out against good people, but it is over. He throws her to the earth below, but she is caught in a tower of dirt. She encases herself in clay, hurling herself at the Man of Steel. He dodges, but missiles strike the city, destroying everything. Seconds later, Superman is standing in the remains of the city, destruction and lava all around him. What did you do? He says, launching himself at her. The earth moves against him, but Superman punches his way through, and lava launches upwards, encasing him. But he merely floats out of it, only his uniform torn. All of this power, you could have given so much to the world. Instead, you've chosen to tear it down. He tells her disappointment in his voice. But it's over! He rushes forward, grabbing her. You can't burn me, break me, bury me, or suffocate me. You're finished. She stares at him, a funny look on her face, when suddenly she snaps back, smiling. That was a close one. I didn't think I'd be able to get it all in time. Superman's confused. Get what? Suddenly, a wave of kryptonite slashes through him, cutting his skin. Just a few rocks, Gaia tells him as he falls to the ground. The kryptonite embedded in his skin, turning him green with sickness. This isn't the end. There will be others. He gasps, and she nods, her eyes glowing. Oh, I know. There's a whole lot of you heroes, but I know what they fear. Across the world, the earth rumbles, splitting the cities, toppling the buildings. Giant waves wash over the land, killing millions as Gaia destabilizes the earth's core. Superman reaches out, the life draining out of his body. This won't make you happy, Terra, he tells her. Sure it will. I'll be alive and free to do whatever I want. <laughs> but without the people who love you, what kind of life is that? Terra turns, watching as Superman falls dead. Tempest watches this world, where those who survived the cataclysm live their lives in constant fear of attracting the attention of a crazed god that rules over what remains of the earth. He watches as the earth is ruled by Gaia and he slips once more into the darkness of the multiverse. And there you have it, the Tales of the Dark Multiverse. Now, like I said at the beginning of this video, there are only five of these right now, and as far as we know, they intend on releasing no more, as they've already released the graphic novel that contain these five. I want to see tons of these, these evil dark stories of the dark multiverse. These could be amazing. So why don't you tell me in the comments down below some of your favorite comic book storylines that you would love to see a dark multiverse version of it.